Hello, and welcome to another in the Why Study series, produced by the Department of Theology and Religious Studies here in the University of Nottingham. And with me today, I have Professor Agatha Bedick robson who is going to try to answer the question, Why study Baruch Spinoza? Agatha, you're welcome. Hello. Uh, Baruch Spinoza, probably the most famous Jewish philosopher of the period between the Renaissance and today. Can you tell us why should we study him? And could you begin by telling us a little bit about Baruch Spinoza? Well, Baruch Spinoza, or Benedict uh, von Spinoza, because or De Spinoza, there are two possibilities are actually naming him. Uh, was indeed one of the greatest philosophers of a life of the modern era, born in Amsterdam in 17th century and active in the second half of this century uh, in Holland. And the reason why there are these two names of him is that he was born as Baruch Spinoza, but at the age of 22 he was excommunicated uh, from the Amsterdam synagogue and completely checked out from the Jewish community. And from this time on, she cha he changed his name to the Latinized Benedictus, which basically means the same, that is, the blessed one. Excommunicated, wonderfully powerful word. Um, why? Well, the reasons are not very clear. Um, uh, we don't really know exactly what transpired between uh, Baruch, the young Baruch, who was a quite eminent uh, member of uh, the Amsterdam synagogue and the chief rabbi of the synagogue. Uh, what was really the quarrel between them? But it seems that the tensions lasted for quite a period and uh, they obviously all sort of were circling around the free thinking issues. I mean, Baruch Spinoza, who was uh, a descendant of the great Marano family from Portugal, probably felt a little bit uh, second class uh, within the Jewish community of Amsterdam that never had to go through this humiliating experience of conversion to Christianity. The Maranos being obviously the Jews of the Spanish region who were forced to um, convert to Christianity, but secretly held their own uh, Jewish faith. So Spinoza was coming from this Marana family, and it is quite probable that he actually suffered a lot of humiliations deriving from this fact. And being a proud and a very intelligent young Jew just could not stand it. And it's also you know, characteristic that only after his father died, he, this sort of conflict between him and the synagogue intensified that eventually issued in excommunication, which was a very powerful instrument at that time because it actually, it actually forbid all the Jews, not only in Amsterdam, in the whole Holland, to communicate with Spinoza at all. So he had to break all his connections with the Jewish community. And of course, to live in any European city at that time and not belong to a religious grouping is really to put you, is to make you a complete loner. Well, he was a bit of a homo satse. I mean, you can use this sort of Latin category mm. to describe a kind of a person without description, mm. uh, without confession. Uh, some say that Baro Spinoza in this way sort of inaugurates the modern uh, tendency of irascination. Right? The sort of losing of identity, uh, becoming a radical atheist, a bit of a man from nowhere. And, uh, and, and we can also detect in Spinoza's philosophy, uh, which was mostly written in the later after excommunication period, these sort of elements of, well, neutrality or non-rootedness, uh, this kind of a universality which will become so characteristic of so many modern philosophers after him. One of the, you mentioned that he becomes a radical atheist, but one of the phrases that is always associated with Spinoza is this phrase, Deus sive natura. Deo, God or nature. But sive in Latin is an unusual word. It means us. Yeah, as. God as nature. God as nature or 
you can use the word God or you can use the word. So how does, what does it mean to say God stroke nature? Well, first of all, I don't believe that Spinoza was a radical atheist. Uh, there is um, a line of reception of Spinoza that fosters this kind of interpretation, uh, especially uh, grounded in uh, the commentaries of the free thinkers of the 18th century who took up Spinoza as their sort of main master and precursor. I actually think that Spinoza was a deeply uh, believing man, although it is very difficult to identify his type of religiosity. And what you just mentioned, this Deus Siva Natura, God as nature, God like nature, uh, well, is a phrase that actually gave a rise to a completely, well, say, new type of modern religion that uh, became a kind of a grounding religion of Freemasons, uh, uh, a kind of a, that was later on called esoteric monotheism. Esoteric monotheism, a kind of a philosophic faith uh, uh, for which Spinoza uh, delivered the foundation. Uh, how can we understand uh, this notion? Well, many Jewish thinkers, truly Jewish thinkers, would say that with this phrase, uh, Baruch Spinoza completely annuls his Jewish origins, that you cannot find a statement less Jewish or less uh, um, in accordance with Judaic faith than actually this one, the phrase that equalizes God and nature, that sort of says that God amounts to the whole of nature. This is the so-called pantheism uh, accusation that was leveled against Spinoza very early, uh, very early on, and actually became kind of a very influential trend within uh, the 18th, and 19th, and 20th century philosophy. The kind of a staple association of Spinoza's philosophy is always pantheism, mm. which means you cannot get further uh, from uh, the revelation, from the Jewish revelation of God as something radically separate from nature or even opposed to nature. Uh, so some people like Hermann Cohen, uh, a very influential 20th century Jewish philosopher, would say that with this statement, Baruch Spinoza just breaks radically with all his Jewish heritage. But there are also some who say that not at all that actually, if you read the sources, Spinoza read himself, the mostly Spanish Kabbalists of uh, the preceding centuries, late medieval and early modern uh, centuries, uh, there will be quite a lot of speculations on the God as the kind of fountain of life or the fountain of being uh, that can be uh, named nature, but obviously not the nature the way we observe it, but the so-called natura naturans in Latin. That is, the nature as a creative force that underlies everything that exists. And uh, there are Kabbalistic uh, um, gematrias. Gematria is the kind of a um, calculation of words and numbers uh, that actually show that uh, the sum of letters that constitutes the Hebrew word Elohim is exactly the same as the sum of uh, that constitutes the Hebrew word Teva, which means nature. So there is this kind of a equality or a parallel uh, between God and nature already indicated in Kabbalah. So what you're saying is that despite the fact that he is excommunicated by the synagogue in Amsterdam, we actually have to read Spinoza against taking his Jewish background very seriously and his own reading of Jewish, the tradition of Jewish religion very seriously. And this allows us to see him rather than as the radical atheist and the hero of atheism, rather as a religious thinker seeking to understand in some other way what the word God might mean. I totally agree. I think that, that uh, it is good to read Spinoza 
as a, as a truly original thinker that completely escapes the simple opposition of uh, orthodox uh, religious thinker, thinking within the Judaic orthodoxy, and radically atheist thinker uh, on the other. There is some kind of a third interesting way that avoids this sort of simple juxtaposition of uh, theism or atheism or pantheism. Uh, uh, and as you just said, I mean, looks for a completely new language to describe the relationship between the deity and the world, and especially the idea of creation. I think that you know that's that's philosophically speaking, but also theologically speaking, the biggest achievement of Spinoza's ethics is actually to give us a completely new vision of creation. At that point, I'm going to stop you and say thank you for introducing us to this wonderful and fascinating thinker. Hagen, it's been great having you.